get, it allows me to be freer. I don't know what I'm going to do when we get into a bigger place, but uh, right now, I'll take advantage of us being here. But anyway, last week, we, on Resurrection Day, or what the world calls Easter, we do not call it Easter here, praise God. Amen. Well, maybe next year I will teach y'all exactly what Easter is. And you will see that it is a pagan holiday based on the goddess Ishtar, the pagan god or goddess, um, the goddess of fertilization. And so we do not celebrate Easter, we celebrate Resurrection Day, glory to God. Amen. But last week on Resurrection Day, we began to talk about our Lord's death and resurrection in the light of God's character and love. And the reason why we have to talk about that is because the idea of Christ rising from the dead has just become tradition to a lot of people. A lot of people um, know that Jesus died. Many of them believe that he rose from the dead. Some of them believe it's just legend. Um, it's, it's just a fictional thing or like, like the stories of the Greek gods and the Greek goddesses and things of that nature. But nonetheless, even Christians didn't, don't sometimes seem to understand the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, praise God. The thing is, is that Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that apart from Jesus rising from the dead, you and I have no hope at all. Glory to God. Amen. And so it was necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead. But we also don't understand the drama that was behind all of that because Satan, when he killed Jesus, and we're going to learn that for the next two weeks that Satan was the one behind the murder of Jesus Christ, not the father, but, the, but Satan. But when he killed Jesus, he thought he had him, praise God. Mm -hmm. And pretty much he did in a sense because death is Satan's realm. But Satan made a bad mistake when he killed an innocent man. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, the uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one says, "He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we in turn might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus." Praise God. Amen. See, Jesus knew no sin. Peter said that there was no sin, no God found in his mouth. Jesus never ever did the slightest thing wrong. How many in here can say that we never ever did the slightest thing wrong? I don't see no hands up. Mine definitely wouldn't go up. I'd have to keep all my hands down because I've done plenty of wrong. How about you? Yeah. Amen. 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 So, but Jesus, he never even had a bad thought, praise God. Amen. It's not to say he never got tempted to have a bad thought because Satan is the one who tries to bring those bad thoughts to us. It's you and I that dwell on them. Amen. Amen. Satan brings thoughts, ideas, and suggestions to our minds, and we decide whether we're going to um, accept those and dwell on them. And Jesus, maybe Satan tried to throw thoughts. Into, if, if you read Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, Satan did make suggestions to Jesus, but Jesus never accepted them. And so Jesus never did a wrong thing the time he was on earth. And so when Satan decided to kill him, Jesus was legally able to be risen from the dead. Praise God. Amen. So the thing is, we got to understand that the whole idea behind the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was concerning the warfare between Father God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit against Satan, hallelujah. Amen. Satan um, hates you and tries to trap you and tries to destroy your life. And so the sacrifice of the innocent son of God was for him to come here on earth to rescue you. He didn't have to do it. There was no legal requirement for him to do it. But love for you and me compelled him to come here and deliver us from our own foolishness and our own sins and our own iniquities. Praise God. Amen. See, we don't want to do that for people. We, you know, people mess up. We tell them, well, you made your bed, so you lie. Thank God 
Jesus didn't do that. We messed up. We made our own beds, but Jesus lied in it for us. Praise God. Amen. Took our place and rose from the dead to ensure our deliverance. Praise God. Amen. Now, but because we need to understand the fact that this was a warfare, we need to deal with some other traditional concepts, some other um, misconceptions concerning the, the death of Jesus Christ that seem to continue to prevail in the churches today. And at this church, because we are a teaching ministry, we like to take the time to explain and undo certain um, thoughts and teachings that are within other churches that are not in accord with the scriptures. Glory to God. Amen. Or in accord within, with um, the truth about God's character of love. You see, many churches teach, and I was somewhat taught this as I was coming up as a, you know, probably before I was a Christian, and coming up as a Christian, many people teach this idea that God is very angry with the human race. He is angry with you, no good, lousy, worthless sinners. And he wants to destroy all of you. And the only thing that's holding him back is Jesus. Jesus is, is standing between the Father and you and saying, Father, calm down. I tell you what, since you just, since you're so sadistic and you want to beat somebody so bad, I'll go down there and die for them, okay? That's the thought that some, that the, they, they may, preachers may not say it that way, but that's kind of the thought that many of them put in, in your heads. Hallelujah. Amen. That's some of the churches that you, some of y'all have been to, and that's the way some of y'all have been taught. That was the way, somewhat the way I was taught. They continue to emphasize the wrath of God was upon you to destroy you. And, and there's a truth to that, but it's not the way a lot of people have taught it. You, if, you under, if you teach the wrath of God in the scriptures, and we'll look at some of that in a moment, you'll understand that the wrath of God is not God so angry and sadistic and want to destroy you so badly that he, he just needed Jesus to, to jump in front of him and say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. No, Turn to John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. You, the scripture that most of you memorized since you were children from Sunday school. John chapter 3. I know most of you can quote this scripture by heart. But John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world. What did God do? He gave his, he gave his, only, begotten he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but ever have everlasting life. Now listen to this. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, does that sound like an angry God who wants to destroy you? No, it does not. Does that sound like a sadistic God who just wanted to, to, he wanted to beat you so bad that he decided instead to beat up on his son, Jesus Christ? No. no. This, what this is, sounds to me like is a God who loves you so much that he was willing to make the greatest sacrifice of all time. Hallelujah. Amen. That's like Donald Trump giving up all his billions of dollars just to save the world. Praise God. Amen. I'm not sure if Donald Trump would do that, but I'm just saying that that's what, what <laughs> that, that giving up Jesus was way, way, way more than that. Praise God. Amen. God loved you. He did not want to hurt you. He did not want to destroy you. On the contrary, he wanted to keep you from condemnation. And that is the reason why God sent his only begotten son. He made the biggest sacrifice. So God was not angry with the human race. Hallelujah. Amen. He's, he was not upset and trying to destroy you. 
On the contrary, God it was and continues to be in love with mankind. Hallelujah. Amen. And he sent Jesus to get us, deliver us, and rescue us from the mess that you and I created in this world due to our own sins and our own iniquities. Glory to God. Amen. And so if you want to understand the wrath of God, or as I put up here, for a better understanding of God's wrath. You know, um, I don't want to get into that today. We're going to we'll probably teach that sometime down the road. You know, we got other things that the Lord is dealing with me about teaching you on. we got to teach on family issues because some of y'all got some family issues that the Lord wants to deal with. Amen. Amen. And, um, and other things of that nature. But when it comes to the wrath of God, some of the ways to understand it is by reading further down in John 3.36. The wrath of God is only after God has constantly, constantly tried to reach you and you continue to refuse his invitation and then he allows you to just suffer the consequences of your sin. Praise God. Amen. And that's, uh, and those scriptures right here uh, pretty much teach that. He, he will allow you to suffer the choices that you have made of your own free will. So when you read John 3.36 and then you know compare that to verses 18 through 20 and then you read Romans chapter 1 and the passages there, you begin to understand that the wrath of God is not God personally inflicting destruction upon you, but God allowing you or giving you up to the works of the devil. Praise God. But um, it will take me a lot more time to um, the, explain that to you than I have, and I don't want to really get too detailed into that. Praise the Lord. But, um, but we need to understand that God was not trying to destroy you, and neither was he so sadistic and so um, bent on hurting someone that he did all this stuff to Jesus Christ. Praise God. We need to understand that this was the work of the devil and the work of demon-possessed men that did what they did to our Lord. Now, the Lord knew that this was going to happen. He predicted that this was going to happen, but he did not necessarily cause it of his own power. Praise God. Amen. But Jesus was willing to go through it in order to rescue you and I from satanic tyranny. Now, one of the scriptures that alludes to this idea that God was what some theologians, you know, I was I, I just got some theology books the other day, you know, because I, I read a lot of these scholarly theology books and um, and this was one of the things that um, some people refer to as divine child abuse of Jesus. The father's divine child abuse of the Lord. Well, there was no divine child abuse, but some scriptures seem to make it appear as though that were so. And one of them is Isaiah chapter 53. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 53, which is in your Old Testament. chapter 53, beginning at verse 4, it, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Now this is talking about Jesus here. And it says that we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That's uh, talking about divine healing here, praise God. Amen. You know, you can go to this scripture when you're sick and say, hey, Jesus bore my sicknesses on the cross. Glory to God. Amen. And you can receive healing in your body through this scripture. But, it, but the thing here in verse 4 says that we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Now a lot of people read this and um, at least I know the people that used to teach me read this and they read it that God 
was when Jesus was on the cross, God was beating him and, and striking him and um, hurting him. Praise God. Does it what that scripture seem like it's saying? No. It doesn't seem like that to y'all. That's because y'all been taught. But the, this, what it's saying here is we did esteem him. It doesn't say that it was actually happening that way. That was the way you and I were thinking. Matter of fact, two other translations bring that out better. The Bible, let me see if I have them up here. I don't remember if I put them up on the screen or not. Okay, I did. The Bible in basic English says it this way. It says, but it was our pain he took, and our diseases were put on him. While to us, he seemed as one diseased. He seemed as, on, as one on whom God's punishment had come. It only seemed that way, praise God. But it wasn't that way. It only seemed to or appeared to us that way. That's what that word esteem means. The easy to read version says, but he took our troubles. He made them his. Isn't that wonderful? He took your troubles and he made them his own. Praise God. Amen. He bore our pain. And we thought, say we thought. We thought. We thought God was punishing him. We thought God beat him something he, for something he did. No, we only thought that, or that's what the people thought was going on, that God was the one striking Jesus. God was the one smiting Jesus. God was the one afflicting Jesus. They only thought that that's what's happening. But then when you get to verse 5, it says, but, but he was wounded. See, that's a conjunction there, praise God. Amen. You know what a conjunction is, right? Some of y'all who took uh, English grammar, a conjunction is joining two thoughts together, praise God. And there's a lot of good buts in the Bible. And I like this but. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So Jesus, God wasn't beating Jesus down as though um, Jesus had done something wrong. God wasn't being sadistic he wasn't being a sadistic, abusive father and trying to hurt Jesus. God simply allowed men and devils to do to Jesus what they felt like doing so that he, in, so in that sense, he can rescue you and I from satanic tyranny, praise God. Amen. And so um, I like what um, Henry Cowles said in his, in his book, The Epistle to the Hebrews with Notes critical and explanatory and practical. He says, Old Testament usage in speaking of God's agency authorizes us to take this as simply permissive, done by others and not directly by himself. But so much as this, the words must mean, God was pleased to permit this bruising. Praise God. Amen. Um, yeah, there it is. So God permitted, he God did not cause this to happen. He permitted it to happen. Praise God. Amen. God is not the one who tried to hurt his son. He permitted the son to go through this, but he didn't do it himself. Um, there's a paraphrase of this passage. Let's look at verse 10 first before we... Let's go down to verse 10 real quickly. It says, I lost the page, let me go back to it. Verse 10 says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So it tells you right here, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now that sounds kind of abusive, don't it? Be honest, don't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like, oh, God was just happy to just hurt Jesus. He was, it's like a, a, an abusive father who seems to get some joy out of beating his kids, praise God. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like here. If you don't study, and that's why you're here in this church, so that you can understand the truth behind this, praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, and the paraphrase, I like the paraphrases are very.
um, at least from up to the um, 16th century, I believe. It says, but although God permitted him to be thus far bruised and afflicted with pains, yet because he has made himself a sacrifice for sin, he shall see his posterity. He shall live a long life. So God permitted him. So there's a difference between God doing it himself and permitting this to happen. Praise God. Amen. An, another tr uh, translation, the Charles Thompson translation, which is um, a translation from the Greek Septuagint. That was the Hebrew scriptures were later on translated into the Greek language and, um, and, and given to the Jews um, during the time of Alexander the Great. But it says that, and the Lord determined to purify him from his distraught when his soul shall be given up for a sin offering. Of you he shall see a seed which shall prolong their days. And then the Bible in basic English also has an interpretation of this. It says him. In Acts chapter 2 verse 23 it says him when he was given up by the decision and knowledge of God you put the death on the cross by the hands of evil men. So basically Jesus was not directly hurt by God. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, the, the Father did not personally put Jesus up on that cross and then beat him and slap him around and do all the things that people imagine that God would do to, to us. Je the, Jesus simply, the Father and Jesus simply withheld the use of their omnipotent power. Remember what Jesus said when Peter sliced off the ear of that dude? Peter, Jesus told Peter, he said, listen, he said, if I wanted to, I could call for a legion of angels and they would come and rescue me. Praise God. Amen. See, Jesus could have, he could have easily gotten out of the situation. But he did it because he cared about you and me. And the father, because he cared about you and me. You know, how many of y'all, when you see your, your child in a situation, if you got the power to stop it, how many of you would stop it? Wouldn't you? You know, it reminds me of the story of a woman one time. Her, her husband, um, you know, they were supposed to be Christians, but, you know, sometimes some Christians are pretty legalistic and can be a um, little ugly sometimes when, when their children are in sin. Well, this father, his daughter, gets pregnant. And he finds out she's pregnant out of wedlock, and he starts beating her. You know, he's a big, big, strong guy. And he just starts beating her and beating her and beating her. I mean, he just beat, he's beating her half to death. And finally, her mother came out with a shotgun and said, you put one more hand on my child and I will shoot you right now. That's a good mother, ain't it? <laughs> ain't it? That's a good mother. She stopped the beating of her child just because... You know, you don't beat somebody just because they messed up. Praise God. And she, um, she stopped the beating of that child with that shotgun. Most of you would probably do that, wouldn't you? you if you had a shotgun, you'd stop somebody from beating your child. Well, think about it. God had all of the omnipotent creative power at his disposal. And he could have stopped that thing any time. He could have just simply spoke a word and everybody who was involved in that thing would have been dead. Praise God. He could have simply just spoke a word and Satan would have been destroyed and his part and his plan in it. However, he didn't do any of that. He let it go. He let it happen. He restrained the use of his power. He stopped the angels from interfering. Praise God. Because they could have interfered. You know, there's some mighty angels. They could have gone in there and they could have, they could have Mess those dudes up. If you read the Bible, um, it was it took one angel to destroy the whole army of Sennacherib, King Sennacherib, and they were one of the most dangerous armies of that time. Only one angel dealt with it. So one angel could have dealt with that whole situation, but God withheld the angels from hurting Jesus. Praise God. That's what the Bible means when it says that. He gave him up. He allowed the Jewish um, leaders to falsely accuse him. Notice that 
when they were falsely accusing him, Jesus didn't even speak a word. He didn't even try to defend himself, praise God. He hardly ever answered them except when they asked him certain questions like, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, so says you. And they started beating him. And he let it happen. He took him before Pilate. And, he, and Pilate asked him a few questions. He wouldn't answer Pilate until, one, until Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, so you say I am? But Pilate couldn't find anything wrong with him. And so Pilate was ready to let him go. But the Jews kept saying, no, no, crucify him, crucify him. And so Pilate finally gave up, you know, because of political um, expediency, he gave Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers beat him, scorched him, pulled out his beard, mocked him, and they put him on a cross. God had the power to stop all of that if that's what he wanted to do. Hallelujah. But had he stopped it, you and I would have no hope. If this world had even lasted long enough for you and I to be born, we would have no hope in this world. We would live, and we would die, and we would go to hell. Praise God. Amen. And we'd suffer in hell depending on how much we sin. Oh, thank God that the Father restrained himself. He restrained himself from doing the things that you and I would do in order to protect our children. Hallelujah. I, see, me, being, a, being a dad, I feel like I have to protect my family. And if somebody even looks at one of my children wrong, I'm ready to, 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 to risk my life to, um, to deal with it. Praise God. Um, and my, as my children know, I remember years ago, um, now I don't know if I should tell that story. That, that might give y'all a bad impression of your past. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> well, I mean, there's been a few times where you know my children were in some delicate situations, and I had to step in and um, and put the fear of God in some people, and it worked. Praise God. <laughs> but, I mean, but the thing is that you know, in most cases, we all of us here are ready to stand up and defend our children, and the Father God. I'm sure was no different. He's sitting there seeing his son being beaten like that. Being placed on the cross. Nails put into his hands. Thorns. And we're talking about these big, thick thorns. Not them little teeny weeny thorns you see here in America. They had some big, thick thorns. And they shoved that thing on his head. You ever had your beard? I mean, well... Not you ladies, I'm talking to you men. You ever had your beard plucked out? You ever had your hair pulled? That hurts, praise God. Mm -hmm. They ripped his beard out. They did all these things to him. And the father, because he was thinking about you and me, he let it happen, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because of us, the father didn't, he didn't go with the inclination that you and I would have went with. I mean, for, for the first time somebody would have punched your son, and you had the power to stop it, you would have gone in there and you would have whooped somebody behind, wouldn't you? Yeah. I probably would too, because I feel bad. Well, you should feel bad, even because I feel bad. <laughs> but, um, you know, violence does. Violence, the only thing that violence begets is more violence. Hallelujah. Yeah. But um, at the same time, I don't think I could just stand there and let somebody do something to my child. But in this case, the father had to let it happen because he was so concerned about having even more children. He sacrificed one child in order to have more children come into the kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That's wonderful. But so we need to understand that the father, he didn't personally do anything. He's not a, the father is not sadistic. He is not into pain and agony. He doesn't want to hurt. He doesn't want to destroy. He has the creative, omnipotent power to do anything, including destroy, if that was the Father's inclination, praise God. Amen. But God uses his creative power to save, not destroy. See, you know, I got some strength, and I can 
could use my strength for one of two things. I could use my strength to hurt people. I could use my strength to help people. I prefer to use the strength that I have to help others, not to hurt anybody. And that's only because I've learned to be more, I'm learning to be more and more like my Heavenly Father. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't, I, I hate violence. I, I don't know about you, but I hate it. I don't even like to watch it on television anymore. I hate violence so much. I mean, that doesn't mean I don't like a good action movie. You know, I like to, <laughs> you know, I mean, I like, I like some, you know, my wife likes comedy. Um, she likes to laugh, so she, so if we do watch a movie, she'll watch some, com some comedy movie. I, me, I'm more of an action guy. I like to see some, some kung fu and some hitting and you know, a little bit of shooting. But um, but I can't stand it when I see somebody getting tortured. You know, you know even in a movie. Praise God. Mm -hmm. I can't stand watching that kind of stuff. I, 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 I don't like um, sadistic and masochistic type of stuff. Um, pain, because I, I can't stand, you know, when, I, when somebody's in pain, I'm all, I start to feel it. I, you, know, you, you know, when you hear about people having their nails pulled out, you know, Christians who are under torture and having their nails pulled out in order to get them to deny Christ, man, that stuff hurts me as I'm reading it. Praise God. Mm -hmm. And so the Father, that's not him. That's Satan. Satan is the one who's sadistic. Satan is the one who's bent on hurting. And Satan is the one who's bent on destroying. Now, if there was any part in the sacrifice of Christ that involved the Father, it was having to turn his back on his son and forsake him. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, I know some believe that Jesus was just merely quoting part of a psalm. Others believe that um, within the um, Aramaic language, Jesus was not really saying that. And most people tell you, don't take it literally. But I don't think Jesus would make a cry about something and not mean what he says, praise God. And at that time, Jesus faced what you and I would now call the wrath of God. If there was a wrath of God that came upon Jesus, it was not the Father personally causing Jesus affliction. It was the Father turning his back on his son and allowing um, the consequences of sin to fall upon him on our behalf. Praise God. Amen. You see, because you and I were God forsaken, if Jesus did not suffer the forsakenness of God, then he didn't pay for our sins. Amen. Amen. Jesus had to suffer every single thing that you and I suffer as a result of our sin in order to pay the penalty for our sin. But Jesus, but as we understand the wrath of God in that sense, we need to understand that God did not personally do anything to hurt his son, but he did turn his back and allow the son to suffer the consequences of, our, of the sin that you and I deserve. Let's look, I want to look at two more passages of scripture on this and then we'll, get, we'll close out. I know this is sort of a little bit different, but are you learning anything at all? Yes. Glory to God. Is this a little different for you? Or have you heard this before? Romans chapter 8. It says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Praise God. Amen. So I want you to notice that the father did not personally do anything to Jesus, but he delivered him up. Praise God. He offered him up. He gave up his son. That's the same as saying he forsook him, praise the Lord. Amen. God 
restrained his power from stopping what was happening to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that was the only way for you and I to be redeemed. Now look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Did I say, tell you two more scriptures? Y'all yeah. know I don't mean what I say sometimes, don't I? <laughs> 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 Psalm 78. Let's look at that very quickly. and Then, then I just want to show you maybe one or two more, and then we'll close out on this. The whole idea is for you to understand the Bible and to understand what the Bible says about these things, to turn away from traditional teachings and traditional statements and teachings that, of people that are not in sync with what the Word of God is saying and to stay with only what the Scriptures say about the Father and about the um, Son and about the Holy Spirit and about the sacrifice that Jesus made. See, if you get the idea that, G, that the Father uh, personally afflicted Jesus, then you'll think that God is so sadistic he'll personally afflict you too. Praise God. I, had, I, I, I read a devotional one time that said that exact thing. It said, you know, talking about when you're going through sickness and things of that nature, and the person in the, in the devotional, it's a classic devotional, um, very well known. By, not even say this, by a man named Oswald Chain, Chambers. But some of the stuff that Oswald Chambers says in some of his books, um, I don't recommend. And one of the things he said was, in your sickness, if the father afflicted his son, then, how, then what is it if he afflicts you too? See, when you get the idea that God is an afflictor, that he's a sadistic abuser, then you'll think that God will do the same thing to you because if he didn't withhold that, sedition from his son, that he won't withhold it from you either, praise God. So that's one of the reasons why I have to teach you this way, because you are not to accept sickness, disease, poverty, um, any of these things, temptation, or any of these things is coming from God. You have to learn to stand against them in the authority of Jesus Christ. But if you believe that they're coming from God, then you can't fight against them, can you? Can you? You can't fight against them. You will stand, you will take them because you'll feel that God is doing this to you and he has a reason for it and that's the way the majority of the church thinks. But when you begin to understand that the Father does not do such things, that he loves you, he cares about you, and he's the one trying to protect you, then you'll learn to stand against them in the authority of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. And when you recognize that the Father just doesn't do that kind of stuff, you'll fight. The Father did allow these things to happen, just like many times he allows certain things to happen to you, but because of what Jesus did in defeating the devil, you now have authority over these things. Praise God. Amen. That's one of the things we're going to be teaching um, within the next couple of months is your authority in Christ Jesus, but you got to get... The understanding, in order to use your authority, you've got to understand who you're fighting against. And you're not fighting against God. Because if you fight against God, you're already lost. Amen. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there's no winning against God. Now, if you're fighting against Satan and his forces, you got, then you got a good, good, good chance as long as you're on God's side. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. The Psalm 78, 50. It, It says, he made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. The reason why I wanted to show you that particular scripture is to see how it reconciles with um, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, where it talks about he spared not his own son, but delivered him up. The way, when God, when it says that God doesn't spare it's saying that God removed his protection and allowed certain things to happen. See, you re remember when Jesus, when he was on the earth, nobody could kill him, praise God. 
They tried. Oh, they brought him all in the midst of all of them. There were several attempts on Jesus' life. But it was not Jesus' time. Because the Father had his protective hand upon Jesus. But when the time came for Jesus to give his life and sacrifice for you and me, then the Father removed that protection and he spared not his son, but gave him up or delivered him over for us. Praise God. Um, one more thing I want to show you, and then we'll close out. In Isaiah 53.10, back to where we were before. And this will, this will introduce you to the last part of this teaching that we're going to do next week. In Isaiah 53.10, It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, we saw that that actually can be understood not as the Lord did it, but the Lord permitted it to happen. Praise God. But now I want you to note, take a look, look at the word bruise. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now look at Genesis 3.15. I promise you this is going to be the very last scripture. Look at Genesis 3.15 very quickly. So we can, get, we can close out. Genesis 3.15. Put it up on the screen. It says... And I will, now this is talking, this is in the Garden of Eden where Satan has deceived Adam and Eve. Well, he deceived Eve, praise God. And Adam followed along like the henpecked husband that he was. And um, God begins to pronounce judgment on Satan in the form of the serpent. If you read um, Revelation chapter 20 verse 3, and Revelation 12, verse 9, you will see that the serpent represents Satan. Praise God. Amen. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, speaking to Satan, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now, the, her seed is talking about Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is the first prophecy of the, of the coming of Jesus to rescue us from the thing that Adam and Eve did to the world. This was the first prophecy of Jesus coming to rescue us. Very, from the very beginning, God decided he needed to help us. Praise God. Amen. And so, but then look at this in verse 15. It says, it, talking about Jesus, shall bruise thy head. But look at this, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Praise God. Amen. Now, if you match that up with Isaiah 53, 10, it was the devil that bruised Jesus. Amen. Amen. It was the devil that did what he did to Jesus. Genesis 3, 15 says, thou shalt bruise his heel. So, when we read scriptures like Isaiah 53, 10, we can read it as the Lord, it pleased the Lord to allow Satan to bruise him, praise God. Amen. And we have scripture authority for that, um, for that paraphrase. Mm -hmm. God did not bruise Jesus. The Father did not bruise Jesus. It was the devil that did it to him. And when you begin to understand that, then you begin to have a better picture of your father. You begin to see that your father is not the sadistic monster that so many people paint him to be, including when they're talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, how God's wrath was poured on Jesus, and how God himself began to afflict his son and smite him because he was angry with the world. No, God is in love with the world, praise God. Amen. He's in love with you and me. Amen. He loves us so much that he was willing to allow Satan to do what he did to Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Amen.